Tuesday night a week ago, Melissa and I went to an Atlanta mayor's debate. It was at the AT&T building in Midtown. Uh, it was an invitation event. 150 or of us or so were there. It was a time of receiving before, and we got to meet candidates and shake hands and all that some time afterwards. One of the most interesting parts of this for me, this has never happened to me before, a candidate, upon learning that I was a pastor, asked for prayer. So right there in the middle of a cocktail reception, there was a circle of us, had our hands joined, we bowed in prayer. I, I liked all of the candidates I met, by the way, very smart, very committed. But when they sat on the platform, and began to answer questions, many of them sounded like politicians. And this is what I mean. Um, I, I, I'm a student of language. I love words. And I love the power of words. I love how people can use language to make things clear. Or in this case, not <laughs> when they have the language skills to do so. I, I wanted and often didn't get just clear speech. I wanted some undecorated nouns paired with action verbs. No. Just tell me what's on your mind. Don't leave me questioning. Don't qualify and nuance and shade and shirk till I can't tell what you're saying. But it was in short supply. But if I'm critical of the politicians for sometimes offering fuzzy, unclear speech, on the other end of the speech spectrum would be the prophet Micah. He is going to tell you what's on his mind. You are not going to leave wondering where Micah stands on the issue. Now, I, I like that in a guy, but I'm not sure I'd want a long car trip with Micah. I mean, he's just a little, he's direct. He brings it bare knuckled. Did you catch this? Hear this, you rulers of the house of Jacob, chiefs of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity. How do you feel, Micah? Just go on, give it to us. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about the prophets being courageous contemporary preachers, not soothsayers. But when Micah gets to the pulpit, he holds no punches. He thunders with clear, blunt language. He speaks on the behalf of God's fury, and he speaks right into the eyes of those who are ab abusing their power. The religious leaders, the political leaders, Micah doesn't care what office you hold, nobody gets spared in his tirade. Micah blasts those who cry peace when their bellies are full, but wage war against the poor who don't have enough to eat. Then he attacks the rulers who offer favorable outcomes if, you know, you give a little something under the table. He even goes after his brothers in the clergy. Priests who are preaching that those, what those in power want to hear. You know, the king keeps a couple of those preachers on payroll, calls them in every now and then. What's the word of the Lord? Oh, good king, God is pleased with your righteous rule. God's favor rests upon you, good sir. Well, Micah's had enough. And he roars. Rulers give judgment for a bribe. Priests teach for a price. Prophets give oracles for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, surely the Lord is with us. Micah's preaching right in the face of power. These are the powerful elite. Now to be fair, everybody has a need for power. But these were the folks who had gotten it and exploited it. But the need for power is universal. 
theologian Reinhold Niebuhr believed that all humans battle with a sense of being dependent and powerless. And that this universal struggle dates back as far as Genesis, when God puts limits on the Garden of Eden, you shall not eat of that tree. But then Adam and Eve wanted to be as God, and so they took power. Then and since, the human species has sought ways to assure ourselves that we have power over our own lives. But what's the right use of power? How do you think of your power? When I was in seminary, when I was teaching in the seminary, you know, I was teaching leadership. And so one of the components of leadership is power. And I'm reading all I can read about leadership. And all, a new book came out titled simply Power. I thought that'd be a good one for me to learn from. I bought it, read not all of it, because I was so revolted before I got through it, I put it down. As you can tell, this is not a recommendation. What Micah was preaching against is what this author seemed to be advocating. It's a power that takes care of me and mine. Here are a few quotes. There might be a point at which flattery toward your boss becomes ineffective but it can't be found in the research. Your job is to ensure that those influential others have a strong desire to make you successful. There's a chapter given to building efficient and effective social networks. Nothing on deep, meaningful relationships, you get just some networks. But for me, this was the most abrasive chapter. Building a reputation, perception is reality. Does your stomach hurt a little? If not, it should. This self-serving climb to the top, this quest for more power so that I can take better care of me and mine is the rewarded American story and it is contrary to our calling. And it is sneaky. It's so sneaky that we're swimming in this self-aggrandizing water all the time, and we're usually not even aware of it. Did you catch, I didn't even catch this till I went back. Did you catch that I started with a story about my attending an invitation-only event to meet the candidates for mayor? See, I'm rewarded for my power in the community, and I want you to know about my power in the community, and so it just kind of sneaks in. But power alone is not evil. P power turned in on itself is corrosive, but power is is value-free. Power is neither good nor bad. It can be either. The prophet railed against those who misused their power. But while he was preaching to them, at the same time, did you notice this? He claimed his own power. But as for me, I am filled with power with the Spirit of the Lord and with justice and might. There is a fickle external power that some people gain by position or influence or money or fame. But Micah declares a sure internal power that's built of virtue and conviction, filled with power and the Spirit of the Lord. And that kind of power is born by prayer. Power, like money, is neither good nor bad. Money and power can be used to build up or to tear down. Money and power may be actuated to declare thy kingdom come or my kingdom come. Micah has power too. 
but he's activating his power for truth-telling, for justice, for caring for those without, for rebuilding what destructive power has torn down. There is an internal power that's born of prayer and trust in God, and it is strong enough to stand in the face of the power that exploits. There's no better illustration of a power built, or of a prayer built moral power than the story that we're celebrating today in the Protestant Reformation. As you've already heard, this is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's disruptive act when he nailed the 95 Theses to the door at Wittenberg. And if you can picture this, at the time, Martin Luther's just a young monk. I mean, he's private first class. This, this isn't a guy with any external power at all. When he nailed these protests to the door at Wittenberg, he was not trying to start the Protestant Reformation. He was just a young priest, motivated by God's Spirit to speak against the same kind of abuses that Micah was preaching against. The church was selling favors to those who had the money. The church had become corrupt. And Martin had the heart of Micah, a young priest just writing what his deepest convictions were and what his heart knew was true. Well, his his challenge to power became a much bigger deal than he could have imagined. And it took on its own narrative and before you knew it he's been charged with heresy attending the trial or the representatives from the German nation the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and perhaps most frightening of all some of the highest representatives of the church a prosecutor named Eck represented the archbishop's office who brought formal charges against Luther Now keep in mind, this is a young guy, no wife, no kids. The church is all the family he knows. And the most powerful representatives of the church and the nation are glaring at him as he takes the stand. Eck asked Luther what parts of his writing he would now formally reject. Uh, So wanting to be careful... He begged for a night to think it over. Well, the next day there's a change of venue. The the first place they had wouldn't hold all the people who were there to watch. They had to go to a larger hall, even more eyes staring down the young monk. He's tremoring in front of the divine majesty. And Eck reiterates the question of the previous day, asking what of his writings will he now denounce? Luther responded, Most serene emperor, most illustrious princes, most clement lords, if I've not given some of you your proper titles, I beg you to forgive me. I'm not a courtier, but a monk. You asked me yesterday whether the books were mine and whether I would repudiate them. They are all mine. Should I recant at this point, I would open the door to more tyranny and impiety, and it would be all the worse should it appear that I had done so at the insistence of the Holy Roman Empire. I cannot renounce these works without increasing tyranny and impiety. If I'm shown my error, I'll be the first to throw my books into the fire. I've been reminded of the dissensions in which my teaching engenders. I can answer only in the words of the Lord. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Eck replied, Martin, how can you assume that you're the only one to understand the sense of Scripture? Would you put your judgment above that of so many famous men and claim that you know more than they all? You have no right to call into question the most holy orthodox faith. 
instituted by Christ, the perfect lawgiver, proclaimed throughout the world by the apostles, sealed by the red blood of the martyrs, confirmed by the sacred councils, defined by the church in which all our fathers believed until death and give to us as an inheritance, in which now we're forbidden by the Pope and the Emperor to discuss, let there be no end of debate. I ask you, Martin, candidly and without horns, do you or do you not repudiate your books and the errors which they contain? Well, power has spoke. And Martin trembles and responds. Since then, your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply. I will answer without horns and without teeth. Unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For me to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. That, my friends, is what real power looks like. That's the internal power that only a life of prayer can cultivate. The prophet Micah said, but as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, with justice and might. Power is neither good nor bad. But many people build their power like a big straw house. And it's tied to job or office or appearance. It's a temporary external power that advances standing, coddles the empire, snaps its fingers at the wait staff, it demands and it stockpiles, I'll take mine now. Well, it's a sad pastoral call when I visit those people in the retirement home because they still snap and bark, but nobody jumps because all of their external power is gone. But there is another kind of power, an internal power that's born of prayer. To use Luther's language, it's a power that's captive to the Word of God. It's a generous power that builds, that advances justice, that blesses others. And it is a power that can never be stripped away without your consent. You are a person of great potential power. Your family, your church, and the kingdom of God are waiting for you to declare your decision. What kind of person of power do you want to be?